Good evening. I'm Dr. Geraldine Tassi, and I would like to thank the PSPC for trusting me to do the lecture on interpretation of basic ECG in pediatrics. I have nothing to disclose. The objectives of tonight's lecture are as follows. To review the basic principles, to outline a systematic approach in the interpretation of a basic pediatric ECG, and to present the similarities and differences between pediatric and adult ECG. For this lecture, we will focus on familiarizing with the normal pediatric ECG. So, tachyarrhythmias and other conduction defects are already beyond the scope of our lecture. The electrocardiogram, or ECG, is important for the diagnosis and management of heart disease in children. It provides an initial insight of the heart condition on top of the history and physical exam. It is a non-invasive laboratory test that records the electric potential of the heart, showing the changes in the magnitude and direction of the electric current generated by the depolarization and repolarization of the peak to that induction test. Pediatric ECGs are regularly performed for a variety of conditions, including chest pain, syncope, and suspected arrhythmia. The following are the sound of the reasons why you order for an ECG. You might want to determine the cardiac rate and rhythm, detect signs of chamber hypertrophy, and diagnose into cardiac conduction disturbances. Other common pediatric implications are as follows. and basically includes almost all cardiac conditions, whether congenital or acquired. In general, the basic principles of ECG interpretation in children are identical to those in adults. But what makes the pediatric ECG unique is that age-related variations are found in almost all aspects, including the heart rate, axis, and intervals, and it is due to the age-related difference in the anatomy and physiology in children. This makes the correct interpretation of ECGs challenging when technique is faulty and when the variability of normal values in children is not taken into account. In 2001, Clinic and colleagues published new age and gender-based ECG normative data that are now used in clinical practice. These norms are available for free online. Regardless of which reference you use, normative data should always be referred to when interpreting pediatric ECGs. The ECG provides a window to the electrical activity within the heart. As a review, everything starts from the sign atrial or the sign stone. It contains the fastest physiological pacemaker cells of the heart and therefore determines the heartbeat. First, the atria will depolarize and contract. After that, the ventricles will then depolarize and contract. The electrical signals between the atria and the ventricles goes from the sinus node via the atria to the AV node and then to the chest bundle and subsequently to the right and left bundle branches which end in a dense network of protein dehydrates. The depolarization of the heart results in an electrical force which has a direction and magnitude or an electrical vector. This vector changes every millisecond of the depolarization. The basis of a properly performed ECG is the replacement. And to measure the heart's electrical activity accurately, Proper electrode placement is crucial. To perform an ECG, the leads are placed on the arms, legs, and across the chest. If you are using a HA system, the mnemonic is white is right and smoke over fire, wherein the black lead is at the left arm and the red lead is on the left leg. On the other side is the mnemonic snow over grass, wherein the white lead is on the right arm and the green lead is on the right leg. This will help to easily recall clean electrode placement. The leads that are placed on the arms and legs create what is known as the proper plane. This includes leads 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, and AVF. The six vertical or frontal plane leads are also known as the lean leads 
n consists of three bipolar and three unipolar leads. The three bipolar leads form a triangle around the heart to show the frontal plane view. This triangle is historically known as the Heinhoven triangle, and it is formed by the axis of the first three thin leads with the heart at the epicenter. The axis of the lead is the imaginary connection between the positive and the negative electrodes of a lead. The last three frontal or vertical leads are unipolar. A unipolar lead has a single positive electrode and a relative negative electrode, which is the heart itself. The unipolar leads, which is also called unipolar lead leads or augmented lead leads, are AVR, AVL, and AVF. The small letter A is used in reference with these leads, which means that they are augmented or enhanced because of their normal small amplitude. The R, L, and F refers to the location of the positive electrode. Thus, the positive electrode is placed on the right arm in AVR, on the left arm in AVL, and on the left foot or leg in AVF. The frontal plane lets you understand electricity moving in the superior and inferior direction. This creates the vector diagram. By understanding where the electricity goes along these vectors, we can understand how the heart depolarizes. Electricity moving towards a lead will create an upward or a positive deflection, and that is known as an R lead. While the electricity that moves away from the lead will create a downward or a negative deflection, and that is known as an S lead. If there is zero net amplitude, meaning the positive is equal to the negative deflection, then that is called an epiphasic The leads that are placed across the chest are known as the precordial leads. The precordial plane loops at the electricity, moving in a more anterior and posterior direction. This includes leads V1 through V6. In pediatric patients, Three additional leads will be placed on the right side of the chest, opposite and symmetrical to the lead V3 and V4, and are labeled V3R and V4R respectively. This is to get a better indication of the right side of course of the heart, which is very important in pediatric patients. Another lead is the lead V7, which is attached at the extreme left over the fifth ICS, left posterior axillary line. The 16 leads and the 9 chest leads comprise the 15 lead ECG. And this is done frequently in pediatrics because patients with congenital heart disease are more likely to have a right sided heart disease. When interpreting ECGs, we should always make sure that they are performed in standard fashion. Take note that ECG reading is all about pattern recognition. So, in order to recognize these patterns, we should interpret the ECG in an easy to remember and systematic approach. In med school, we were always taught a step by step approach to reading ECGs. The most important thing is to develop a systematic way of reading ECG that is comfortable for you. For our lecture, we will be adapting the four easy steps to ECG interpretation, and this includes the determination of the rate and rhythm, the evaluation of the frontal QRS axis evaluation of hypertrophy, and evaluation of the wave segments and intervals. At the end of our lecture, our goal is to be able to fill up this information in all the ECG result forms that we will encounter in practice. So, are you ready? First things first, you have to check the name on the top of the ECG and make sure that that is the correct patient. And then, check for the age of the patient. You have to remember that the heart physiology and the normal values vary in different age groups in the pediatric population. And then, check the date. Make sure that this is the one you ordered. And if there are old ECGs, it's always a good idea to compare with an old one. And then lastly, you have to check the speed and the calibration. This is a standard ECG paper 
circumference and it is made up of small and big squares. The height of the square refers to the voltage or amplitude, while the width of the square refers to the time or speed. Each small square is equal to 1 mm and has an amplitude of 0.1 millivolts and speed of 0.04 seconds. In one large square, there are five small squares, so that would be 5 mm or an amplitude of 0.5 millivolts and a speed of 0.2 seconds. ACD should be recorded at a standard 25 mm per second speed with full standard voltage at 10 mm per millivolt. The calibration for speed and voltage can be found at the beginning or the end of each row, and this refers to the standard distribution mark. The amplitude refers to the size of the deflection of the ACD. So the standard distribution mark should be 10 small squares high, which will correspond to 10 mm per millivolt. If it is full standard, the standard distribution mark's height should be 10 small squares or 2 big squares. While if it is half standard, its height is only 5 small squares or 1 big square. You will have to double the amplitude in all the waves to normalize them and get the actual value in this case. The calibrations may be adjusted by the technician for various reasons, so you must recognize these adjustments to correctly interpret this ECG. The standard paper speed is usually at 25 mm per second. Since each small box is 0.04 seconds, each big box will have 0.2 seconds, and the whole strip is 6 seconds or 30 big boxes. For tachyarrhythmias, the speed of the ECG may have been increased to 50 mm per second in order to visualize the PVs. And in this case, the speed and duration of the ECG components will need to be divided by 2. These are the different waves, segments, and intervals of the ECG, and we will be discussing them briefly as we go along. Let's now go to the first step, which is to determine the rate and rhythm. When looking at the rates, there are different ways of figuring out what the patient's heart rate is on an ECG rate. The mathematical way is counting the number of boxes between two QRS complexes. Using lead 2 or the lead to the least artifact, calculate the approximate heart rate divided by 3 with the number of large squares with each QRS complex. For example, we have divided 300 by 4, and this gives us an estimate heart rate of 35 minutes per minute. Another way to do it is to divide 1,500 by the number of small squares between each QRS complex. In the same example, we divided 1,500 by 20, which also gives us an estimated heart rate of 75 minutes per minute. Another way to measure the heart rate is through the estimation method. If you assume a QRS complex starts on a thick line, and then you count 300, 150, 175, etc. For every large square, then you can see where the next QRS complex lands and get a rough estimation of what the patient's heart rate is. In this example, we have four large squares between two consecutive R waves. If we count off the large squares in the sequence mentioned, the next R wave lands at approximately 75 bits per minute. Take note that this method only works if the rhythm is regular. Again, remember that the heart rate of pediatric patients varies with age and the normal ranges are quite large. So referral to the norms is essential. As mentioned, there are several reference ranges published for heart rate and this includes the normative ECG data by Windows as mentioned earlier as well as the PALS guidance. The next step is to check the rhythm. The most important rhythm that you want to see in an ECG is the sinus rhythm. This is the normal rhythm for all ages where the heart rate is based by the S in pain. In sinus rhythm, you have to ensure that there is a pain wave for every QRS complex, and every QRS should be preceded by only one pain wave. It is also present if the PR interval is consistent to what the pacing and the P-wave deflection is positive in 1, 2, and AVS, but negative in AVR. 
beware of armed with the versal as this will cause false theory that may not exist. Some imperial rhythms may have three waves in front of every QRS, but with an abnormal P axis. Sinus rhythm is not present if the P wave is negative in U2 and ABF, but positive in EBR. This pattern may be consistent with the non sinusoidal atrial rhythm, such as when the intrinsic cardiac pacemaker is in the low right atrium or in the left atrium. Sinus arrhythmia is a normal variation in sinus rhythm that occurs with aspiration. In this rhythm, there is variation in the P2P interval of more than 0.12 seconds or two small boxes. The heart rate rises and falls with inspiration and expiration. The variation is more pronounced in young children and less pronounced in infants and adolescents. Sinus bradycardia is a slow sinus rhythm seen normally in aerobically trained individuals but also occasionally in hypothyroidism and long fetus And sinus tachycardia is a fast sinus rhythm that is consistent with anxiety, crying, fever, and occasionally hypothyroidism. Let us now move on to the second step, which is to evaluate the frontal QRS axis. The QRS axis represents the overall mean direction of ventricular depolarization and is important in supporting a diagnosis of ventricular hypertrophy and other conduction disturbances or congenital heart It is routinely calculated in the frontal plane using the mean Normal axis varies with In normal adults, electricity moves downwards and to the left towards the left ventricle. As a result, electricity goes towards the southeast quadrant as it will see here in this diagram. This makes V1 positive and this will have an R wave in V1 and also makes AVF positive and thus too will have, a, have an R wave. In children, the right ventricle is more dominant since it is a thicker ventricle in utero. As a result, electricity tends to move downwards and towards the right side of the chest. At birth, the R waves are prominent in the right proportion and the S waves are prominent in the left proportion. As the child grows, QRS axis approaches that of a mother. Like with any other parameters, normal ranges of QRS axis vary with age. The mean and ranges of the normal QRS axis according to age are shown here. The most convenient way to determine the QRS axis is the rule of thumb. In this method, we will look at the QRS complex of U1 and U ABF, and we will use our left thumb and our right thumb to represent the flexions of the leads respectively. If both leads 1 and ABF are positive, we will get two thumbs up, meaning it is within the normal axis. If the QRS complex in U1 is positive and negative in U ABF, you will have your left thumb up, meaning there is left axis rotation. On the other hand, if the QRS complex in U ABF is positive and negative in U1, you will have your right thumb up for the right axis rotation. But if both thumbs are pointing down, there is extreme right axis rotation. But we have to see that this pattern is only true for older children since few boys and infants can still have a normal axis of about 1 18 degrees. Another method is to plot the QRS reflections in the units using the hexagonal reference system. The positive or negative direction of the lead will correspond to the net reflection of the QRS complex. For example, the QRS complex in U1 has a net positive deflection, so we plot it up at the positive direction of U1, which is in 0 degrees. Next, in U2, there is also a positive deflection, so we plot it at 60 degrees. In U3, there is also a positive deflection, so it is plotted at 120 degrees. In UDVR, there is a negative deflection, so we plot it at the negative side of the lead, which is at positive rate. For the ADL, it has a more negative deflection since the S wave has two small 
boxes while the R wave only have one small box. So we plot it at positive 150 degrees. And lastly, with ADF has a positive deflection, so we plot it at the positive 90 degrees. Looking back at all the plotted points, the middle point is in between the positive 60 and 90 degrees, hence the approximate axis is at the 75 degrees. Now, what if there is an epiphasic QRS, meaning the R wave has the same amplitude as the S wave? In this case, we have to look for the perpendicular lead in the head section reference system. For example, in lead 1, the perpendicular lead is lead ADF, and vice versa. Next, determine if the perpendicular lead is positive or negative. Then the resulting axis will then correspond to that lead. Say if the QRS complex in ADF has a positive deflection, so the corresponding axis will be at positive 90 degrees. Another example. In this case, the epiphasic QRS complex is at lead 3. So the perpendicular lead will be in lead ABR. Looking at the ECG, the QRS complex at lead ABR has a net negative deflection. So the corresponding axis will be at positive 30 degrees. Since the normal axis differ among age groups, abnormal QRS axis is defined as follows. If the QRS axis is less than the lower limit of normal for the patient's age, then there is left axis deviation. If the QRS axis is greater than the upper limit, then there is right axis deviation. Another important axis in the pediatric population is the superior axis which is defined between minus 60 to minus 100 degrees and is suspected that there is a negative QRS in lead ADF. The two most common diseases which cause this is atrial ventricular septal defect, which is commonly seen in patients with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, and tricuspidal defect. We are now down with the weight, rhythm, and axis. Next is to evaluate for the chamber enlargement and hypertrophy. As a review, the right ventricle is generally larger than the left ventricle at birth. Through the changes in systemic vascular resistance, the LV eventually increases in size and becomes larger than the RV by one month of life. At six months of life, the ratio of the RV to LV is already similar to that of an adult. First, let's discuss the criteria for ETL enlargement. We should always look at the P wave in leads 2 and B1 as this gives the most prominent reflections on an ECG. The ECG criterion for right ETL enlargement is the presence of a thick, tall P wave in leads 2. The upper limit of normal for the P wave amplitude is 2.5 mm over the age of 6 months and 3 mm from 0 to 6 months. This can be accompanied by a biphasic or tall P wave in leads 2. The criteria for left atrial enlargement includes a broad notch P wave in the two with P wave duration of more than 0.10 to 0.12 seconds and a deep slurred biphasic P wave in the one, particularly when the terminal negative component is broadened. By atrial enlargement is considered to be present when signs of both right and left atrial enlargement are present. In terms of hypertrophy, the QRS complex can tell us about the mass of the ventricles based on the size of the deflections on the ECG. Right ventricular hypertrophy as the more accepted criteria for its diagnosis. This includes a tall R wave in D1, a deep S wave in D6, QR pattern in D1 or in the right sided chest tubes, and right axis deviation. In this ECG, there is RVH based on a tall R wave in D1 and a deep S wave in D6. RS ratio is also increased in D1 and increased in D6. Another simple way is the use of even string rules of RVH using only B1. First is the presence of upright P waves in B1 after about 7 days of age, up to 7 years. Next is an RSR prime pattern in B1 
in which the R prime is taller than the R. And last is the presence of pure R wave in V1 after about 6 months of age. Left ventricular hypertrophy has less accepted criteria. This includes a large R wave in V6 and a deep S wave in V1, which is like an opposite of the criteria for RDH. Hearing abnormalities are the most reliable indication of RDH. A so-called string pattern consists of the inverted T wave in the interior leads 2, 3, and BF, and left recorded leads B5 and B6. Left axis deviation is supportive of the diagnosis of LDH, especially in infancy. In this ECG, we have deep S waves in B1 and tall R waves in B6. There are also T wave inversions in B3, 5, and B6, and there is left axis deviation. These are all indicative of a left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. Another way of determining is using even show for LVH to see only with B6. If the R wave in B6 intersects the baseline to lead B5 in a standard drug in ECG, then there is LVH. The diagnosis of combined or biventricular hypertrophy is made most easily when there is a clear criteria present for both RVH and LVH. It is also considered in the presence of large epiphasic 2RS complexes in two or more of the leads in V3 to V5, wherein the total voltage of the R and S leads are equal to or more than 60 mm, and this is called the patch of Bell phenomenon. The last step in our approach is to evaluate the PQR S2 leads segments and intervals using V2 or the lead with the least artifact. Let's start with the P wave. The P wave reflects a field of polarization where electricity starts at the sinus node and spreads right to left across the atria. Thus, the first half of the P wave reflects right atrial contraction and the last half of the P wave reflects left atrial contraction. We should always look at the normal values when deciding whether or not a P wave is of an abnormal size. But a rough number to keep in mind are P squares high and P squares wide or an amplitude less than 2 mm or 0.3 mV, or duration less than 0.12 seconds. Moving on to the PR interval. This is measured from the beginning of the P wave up to the beginning of the QRS context. This reflects the time of the onset of atrial depolarization with the onset of ventricular depolarization. Again, we should always look at the normal values when interpreting these movies, but a good number to remember is less than 0.2 seconds for a normal PR interval. Take note that the PR interval is also heart rate dependent, and it can be normal, long, or short. In older children and adolescents, if the PR is less than 0.2 seconds but does not adjoin a wide-based QRS, it is likely normal. Here's the table of the upper limits of the normal PR interval according to age and weight. Examining the PR interval will help you determine whether a patient has some degree of heart block. If some or all of the waves are not followed by a QRS or the PR interval vary, then you should consider the presence of an AD block. Remember, in the simplified method of ECG interpretation, it is more important to recognize the presence of an AD block than to specify the degree of AD block. At any age, a PR interval of more than or equal to 0.2 seconds or one big box is already prolonged and consistent with first degree AD block. This means that the electricity moves through the AD node and makes it down to the ventricle causing a QRS complex to occur, but in a more sluggish way. Just like in sinus rhythm, after every P wave, there continues to be a QRS complex and the PR interval is constant. In infants and young children, a PR interval of more than 0.16 seconds or for small boxes is already long and consistent with the first degree 
This baby seal in rheumatic fever, it was a heavy hex, it was toxicity, or it may also be a normal virus. Here is an example of first degree AD block. It looks similar to a sinus rhythm, but if you look closely, you can see that the PR interval is almost one and a half big blocks long. In second degree AD block, there are two types. There is modus type 1 and modus type 2. There are subtle differences between the two, but what makes them both second degree heart block is that electricity from time to time gets blocked in the AD node, and thus you will have a PA wave without a PRS complex or speed. In modus type 1 or the rank back phenomenon, there is a progressive prolongation of PR intervals with each succeeding day until there is a drop in And this can be normal in some patients. So here is an example of the modus type 1 pattern where you can see the progressive prolongation of the PR interval until there is a stick meet as pointed by the eye. In contrast, modus type 2 heart block has a normal or prolonged PR interval but is constant all throughout until there is a drop meet. And unlike modus type 1, modus type 2 is always a pathologic time to In this continuous rhythm strip, you can see prolonged PR intervals that are constant all throughout until there are split beats as pointed by the iris. Third degree heart block or complete heart block means that there is no conduction between the atria and the ventricles, meaning the AV node is shut down completely. As you can see, the atria and the ventricles are completely dissociated and thus they are getting independent of each other. The QRS is usually constant and lies within the range of 15 to 17 minutes per minute. This ECG shows a complete heart block. As you can see, the T-waves pointed by the red arrows are completely dissociated and independent from the QRS complexes, which is pointed by the green arrows. Let's now move on to the QRS complex. A normal conduction to the ventricles can be seen by evaluating this complex. The QRS duration is the duration from the start of the Q wave up to the end of the SQ and it is best measured in the side. It increases slowly from 0.5 seconds at birth to the adult noise of 0.8 to 0.10 seconds at age 16. A wide QRS duration indicates that there is a ventricular conduction disturbance where the impulse is delayed or abnormally constricted across the ventricle. It can be seen in right or left bundle band block, work parting from right symbol, and in ventricular arrhythmias. Low voltage QRS complexes are present when the QRS amplitude is less than 5 mm in all wind leads and less than 10 mm in all preferred wind leads. These are non specific findings that may occur with various conditions, including myocarditis, pericardial effusion, and generalized immunity. When the wave of septal depolarization travels away from the recording electrode, the first deflection inscribed is negative, and this is the Q wave. Thus, small septal Q waves are often present in the lateral leads, usually in leads 1, ABL, B5, and B6. These are called non pathologic Q waves, which are less than two small squares deep and less than one small square wide and should be less than 25% of the amplitude of the corresponding R wave. The T wave reflects ventricular repolarization. The direction of the T wave can change as the patient ages, causing the juvenile T wave pattern, which is normal in children. The T wave is usually upright until 7 days of age. Between one week and adolescence, it is negative, and then it reverts back to upright again in adolescence and adulthood. Certain metabolic disturbances can cause abnormal T waves. Thick T waves that are taller than half the size of the preceding QRS may be seen in hyperkalemia, while flat or low T waves may occur in hypokalemia. The most important interval is the QT interval. It represents the time between the onset of the ventricular depolarization and then the free polarization. The actual QT is measured from the beginning of the QRS complex up to the end of the Q wave, while the corrected QT or QTC on the other hand signifies correction to a heart rate and is computed using the Bazet formula. A long QTC of more than 0.45 seconds is abnormal and can result in sudden death. 
To compute for the corrected QT, we divide the actual QT duration by the square root of the preceding RR complex. To get the actual QT duration, we multiply 0 0.04 by the number of small squares in the QT interval. In this ECG, it has 10 small boxes. Then, we get the RR interval by multiplying 0 0.04 by the number of small squares within the QRS complex right before the actual QT method. So, in this example, there are 20 small boxes in the RR interval. And after that, we get the square root of the product. So, applying the Bezet formula, we get 0.45 seconds. Again, we have to look at normal values to determine whether or not this calculated QT interval is abnormal for your patient. But in general, it should be less than 0.45. It is important to measure the QT interval accurately as patients with prolonged QT intervals are at risk for particular erections. This ECG represents a patient who has congenital long QT symptoms. And the QT interval here is at 0.6 seconds. Moving on to the ST segment. This is measured from the end of the QRS complex to the beginning of the T wave and it represents the early part of the polarization of the RGN element. This is normally isoelectric in that it is flat running across the baseline and the ST segment elevation or depression is determined by measuring 0 0.04 seconds or at least a small box after the end of the QRS complex or the J time. Changes in ST segment can reflect either ischemia or inflammation. However, the former is quite unusual in pediatric population. Lastly, the U wave represents the final stage of repolarization, and if seen taller than 2 mm, it may suggest hypokalemia or digoxin toxicity. In conclusion, pediatric cardiology services are not always immediately available. Age-related changes in the anatomy and physiology of infants and children to these normal ranges of electrocardiographic features would differ from adults in various age. And awareness of these differences, knowledge of basic principles, and a systematic approach are the key to correct interpretation of pediatric electrocardiograms. These are my references. Have a great evening and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Jerry, for that comprehensive lecture on the interpretation of the ECG in the pediatric patient. So for our participants who may have questions, I would like to encourage you to key in your questions at the Q&A portion of our chat box. Uh, and we will try to address these later at the q and portion or the open forum. And also as a reminder to our participants for you to get a certificate for this proficiency series or for this webinar, we encourage you to please answer the evaluation form as well as the post-test at the end of the lecture series. Uh, for the post-test, you need to answer at least 8 out of the 10 correctly for you to get a certificate. However, please do not be discouraged when you get a score of less than 8 because you may have you still have the chance of retaking the exam until you get a score of at least 8 out of the 10 questions. So that's all for the lecture of Dr. Kasi. And for our next speaker, we are in um, we will be having the interpretation of the chest X-ray. Uh, we have here tonight. Dr. Sara Victoria L. Zampaga. Dr. Zampaga is a fellow of the Philippine College of Radiology. She is also a fellow of the Ultrasound Society of the Philippines and a fellow of the CTMRI Society of the Philippines. She earned her medical degree at the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center Incorporated, had her residency in general radiology at the Philippine Heart Center, had her fellowship training in computed tomography, ultrasonography, and interventional radiology also at the Philippine Heart Center. Currently, Dr. Zampaga is a medical specialist three at the Philippine Heart Center. She is the division training officer of the CG Radiological Sciences Division. She is the chairman of the Philippine Board of Radiology, as well as the PCR representative on the Philippine Coalition Against Tuberculosis or PHAT. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome for the interpretation of the basic chest x-ray in pediatrics, Dr. Sara Victoria L. Zampaga. Good evening everyone, I am Dr. Sara Zampaga and for tonight, I will be discussing the basics of cardiovascular imaging. For my disclosures, I have no financial disclosure or conflicts of interest with the materials in this presentation. Images are from our prescribed textbook from different radiology websites and actual patients who were anonymous. For tonight, our objectives are to be able to dissect chest radiograph interpretation to be able to distinguish between congenital and acquired heart diseases based on chest radiograph, and to be able to identify the more common congenital and acquired heart diseases. Okay, so we have here a uh, chest PA radiograph. So this is the basic view that we usually request for. Okay, so we will correlate the flow of blood with the cardiovascular structures. The border forming structures of this thing. Okay, so on the right side you can see the flow of blood from above and from below from the SBC and IBC as they go into the right atrium. Okay, from there blood will go to the right ventricle and out through the outflow tract into the main pulmonary artery, the right and left pulmonary arteries. They will go into the pulmonary circulation where they will be drained by the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle and out into the aorta and into the systemic circulation. Okay, so on the right side, the border forming structures are the SBC, the RA, and the IBC. On the left side, we have three normal bulges or three contours from the aortic knob, the main pulmonary artery, and from the left ventricle. Okay, so the right ventricle is not border forming in the PA view. In the lateral view, only the right ventricle is seen anteriorly. Okay, so it will go into the pulmonary arteries, right and left, into the pulmonary circulation and will be drained by the pulmonary veins and into the left atrium and into the left ventricle. Okay, so from the left ventricle, it will go to the aorta. So we should always have a clear left sternal and a clear left cardiac space. Okay, so our border formers here anteriorly we have the right ventricle. And posteriorly, we have the left atrium securely and the left ventricle inferiorly. Okay, so here are the steps in evaluating the chest x-ray. These are my only recommendations, you know, so you can have your own system. The idea here is to have uh, your own. Okay, so you may either go from in to out or out to in. So just remember that you should be systematic so that you will not leave out any important details. So for me, this is how I do it. I usually look at the pulmonary vascularity first. Okay, so because from here, I can already deduce whether I am dealing with an acquired or congenital heart disease. Then after that, I go and look at the cardiac size and configuration. And then the great vessels, so the main pulmonary artery and the aorta. And lastly, I look at other findings. Okay, so now let's go first to pulmonary vascularity. Okay, so from here you can see uh, we have the three types of vascularity that we see. Of course, we have the normal vascularity and then diminish and increase. Okay, so in the finish, we see that in right of obstruct conditions. So I will just discuss the more common ones. So under here, we have the tetralogy of hello and the steams anomaly. Okay, so for normal patient, of course, we see um, normal vascularity. 
uh, in one location and then also in partition and pulmonary stenosis. Okay. So on the right side, we have increased vascularity. So we say further whether it is active or passive increase. Okay. So here in this next uh, diagram, we can see the division. Okay. So for active, uh, we see this in left to right shunts and in complex heart diseases, complex congenital heart diseases. Okay, so you will see this in the non-cyanotic left to right shunts and here it is the cyanotic um, hypervascular congenital heart diseases. Okay, so we will be discussing ASD, BSD, and PDA. And for the cyanotic, we have the transposition of great arteries, persistent truncus arteriosus, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return. On the other side, we have the passive increase in vascularity. So we see this in congestion, in pulmonary venous hypertension, or in left side obstructive lesions like um, mitral stenosis or uh, in uh, vascular heart diseases. Okay, and also in left side myocardial dysfunction. Okay, so from this diagram, you can already say or see that in active increase, we see this in congenital heart diseases, and passive, we see this in acquired heart diseases. Okay, so for us to be able to say whether it is increased or decreased, we should be very familiar first with what is going on. Okay, so if you will draw two vertical lines, we will now have three zones. We have the central or hilar zone, the mid zone, and the peripheral zone. Okay, so we would expect the vessels in the central zone to be greater in cali caliber. Okay, so they will decrease in caliber as they go peripherally, such that within 1 to 2 cm from the periphery, you don't really expect to see blood vessels. Okay, so now if you draw two horizontal lines, we can have three divisions. You have the apical on up or upper, the mid zone, and the basal zone. So we expect more blood vessels in the bases. Okay, so because of the pulling of blood, more vessels below are in the bases. So that is normal. Furthermore, we should also be able to appreciate the orderly configuration of the vessels. Okay, so you can see the branching. You can see a decrease in caliber from center to periphery. Okay, and we should be able to appreciate the borders. They should be very distinct. Okay, so in increased vascularity, as in active congestion, you will see the vessels dilate. Okay, so they are more plump, but still you can appreciate the individual walls. And they may extend further into the periphery. Okay. If you want to be more objective about it, we have this other parameters. We have the right descending pulmonary artery to crater index. Okay, so this was recommended by Kuzmen and Doreen. And um, they based the diameter of the RDPA as it is parallel to the right lower bronchus. Okay, so it said that the diameter of the plate should be equal to that of the RDPA normally. But in patients with left to right shunts, the diameter of the right descending pulmonary artery will be now greater than that of the plate okay, so here, you can see, it is very dilated versus that of the plate Another concept that we use also here, um, in this uh, very focused image, I hope you can appreciate this arteriole that is beside the bronchial. So these two structures are seen from center to periphery. Okay. 
In patients with hypervascularity, you would expect the arterial to be greater in caliber than that of the main So we call this sign the monocal sign. Okay, so when we see this, we can surmise that there is indeed hypervascularity. Okay. So just to emphasize the difference, you can see here the normal central prominence and the basal prominence. There is a normal branching and distinct walls, but uh, there is decrease in caliber. Whereas here in increased vascularity, you can see that the vessels are dilated. Okay, very dilated, but still with very distinct walls. Okay, so in a lateral view, this is the pulmonary artery, and in a patient with hypervascularity, you can see the best, the main pulmonary artery and pass, which is the Okay, so now let's go to passive congestion. We see this in left side failure. Okay, so there will be dilatation of the pulmonary veins and translation of fluid into the perivascular tissue. And there will be appearance of curly lines which will indicate interstitial edema. And then subsequently, there will be loss of the normal sharpness of the individual vessels. They become dizzy and indistinct and pain -filled. So we say that there is now alveolar edema. Okay, so here, we don't see any more the individual vessel walls. There is now loss of sharpness. It's this lazy and indistinct unclean film. Okay, so again, to emphasize the difference, you can see in active congestion, the vessels are dilated with distinct walls versus in passive congestion, we don't appreciate any more the individual vessel margins. It is just hazy. Okay, so for decreased vascularity, we see this in right outflow tract obstructing lesions. Okay, so we can just see here a very dark appearing lung. Okay, so you can hardly see the right descending pulmonary artery. So you see on X-ray, generalized hyperlucency or pulmonary albumia. Because we know that the vessels are the ones that give the white appearance on the lungs. Okay, so the vessels appear thin and skinny. Okay, to emphasize again the difference, we can see normal vascularity versus here. The right descending is very small and the rest of the lungs are hyperlucent because there is decreased vascularity. Again, on the lateral view, you can see the main pulmonary artery in the pass. And here it is very small, diminishing, you can hardly see it. There are cases when we see unequal pulmonary blood flow, like in the trilogy of Colon, in which the left thumb usually show diminished blood flow or in persistent trophic arteriosis, where in either lung or the small lobe of the lung can manifest this finding. But in this case of persistent trophic, you can see preferential flow to the right lung. Okay, so in normal individuals, there is slightly more blood flow to the right. Vascularity in pulmonary hypertension. This is seen in associated with long-standing long left right shorts or intracardial fluid solutions. Okay, so you can see the pulmonary artery branches show proximal dilatation and abrupt tapering or constriction over their distal fluids. Okay, so we're done with vascularity. Not okay, it's we measure the, actually this is the same for adults, no? so this is how we measure. We get the internal diameter of the chest at the level of the right vein. Okay, and then we 
is a uh, target place for you. Okay, so you have a saggy or droopy appearance or a heavy heart. Heavy appearing heart. Okay, so LD enlargement. Okay, so there will now be a bulging of the inferior portion of the posterior thyroid cilia. So now there is loss of the retrocardic space. Okay, so now let's go to the great vessels. Okay, pulmonary artery and the aorta. Okay, so for the pulmonary artery, we say that it is dilated or convex. In left to right shunts or in trochardic mixing lesions, in pulmonary valvular stenosis with post-stenotic dilatation, then pulmonary valvulation. Okay, so here is dilated convex. Or it may be small, flat, or concave. We see this in two cases. Either there is underdevelopment, as in the case of POF and Epstein, okay. or in this case it is concave. Or if there is a normal positioning, like in Compus, Arteriosus, and Transposition. Okay, so now let's go to the aorta. We assess the aorta according to its size, position, and shape. The size. In ASD and BSD, we would expect the aorta to be small or diminutive because it is excluded from the circuit. And we would expect it to be a large in cases of in AES or aortic stenosis, only the ascending portion will be prominent. Whereas in aortic regurgitation, the entire course of the aorta will be large. Okay, so I'll discuss this further later on. Now let's go to the position. Normally, it is in the left side, but there is a small percentage of uh, normal patients with the disorder in the left side. Okay? But we also see them along with uh, congenital heart diseases like in focus arteriosus. We expect to see this in 35% of patients with the in 33 to 35 percent of patients with compost hyperosis. Okay, so if you see, um, this one is diminished vascularity with a right-sided aorta, likely it is POF, and in the second case, it is hypervascular with a right-sided aorta, is likely to be this. And then, we look at the shape. Okay, so from this view, you probably cannot appreciate it, but there is a constriction in the descending portion. Okay. And it's hard to see it uh, from this distance, and also there is a superimposition on the bones. Okay. So if you focus on it, you can get to see the figure of the design. Okay, so we see that in the artesian. Okay, and then lastly, ancillary findings like uh, bone changes. Okay, so we see rib notching like this. Uh, we see the rib notching in the inferior margins of the ribs. Okay, so we see this in partition of the aorta because of collaterals. Or in patients who have had previous Blalock uh, Tausig or BPS, or a history of telephony in their early life. Okay, so other findings that we see, we have here a radial hypoplasia, the radius is small. Okay, so if you see this, then uh, you might have to consider doing a more general checkup with the heart, check for congenital heart diseases because it has a high um, incidence with uh, ASD, BSD, or 
is in both orange and blue. Okay, so you can also see premature sternal fusion with associated pectus chiropractin or in patients with uh, severe scoliosis, um, these are often um, correlated with inherited heart disease. So now we're done with the, the basic part. Now let's move on to the congenital heart diseases. Okay, so I divided this according to this one first, the asymmetric hypervascular. Okay, so we see this in ASD, VSD, and PBA. Okay, so oh, in the next few slides, you will be seeing this nice uh, hemodynamics diagram. Okay, so this was uh, from our uh, textbook from um, the basic imaging congenital heart disease by Dr. Yarek Swisscha. So, um, just to give you an idea what we would expect to see over there to do. Okay, so in ESD, the shunt is at the level of the atrium. Okay, so we would expect that whatever blood goes into the left atrium will be shunted to the right atrium and into the right ventricle. So we would expect the right side of the heart to be enlarged or to be prominent. Okay, so more blood going into the pulmonary artery, so this one as well will be enlarged, complex, or the way bed. And then there will be more blood going into the pulmonary circulation, so increased vascularity. Okay, so if we go to the left atrium, we will not expect this to be enlarged anymore, as well as the left ventricle and the right one. So only the right side. Okay, so radiographically we see hypervascular lung fields, an enlarged RA, an enlarged RB, and an enlarged main and pulmonary arteries, a small aorta. Okay, so here we have an X ray showing RA and RB aorta. Okay, so let's follow the system that I said earlier. So there is increased vascularity, an enlarged heart with RA and RB prominence. The main pulmonary artery is convex or dilated. The aorta is small. Okay, so diagnosis, shunt anomaly, consistent with ASD. Okay, another example, hypervascular, RA, RB. They look at MPA and central vessels. Another example. In this case, the RA is not that large, but here you can see the RB. Okay. So you have increased muscularity, RB enlargement, convex or prominent or dilated MPA. And that is ASD. Now, uh, let's move on to BSD or ventricular septal defect. Okay, so now the shunt is at the level of the ventricles. Okay, so blood going into the left side, shunted to the right ventricle, so more blood going into the pulmonary artery, so this will be large, this will be increased, more blood going into the left side. Okay, so we would expect the left side of prominence. But the aorta now is excluded from the circuit, so it will be small. So hypervascular, enlargement of either or both ventricles, and a large area, a large main and central pulmonary arteries, and a small thoracic aorta. Okay, so here you can see the heavy appearing heart or the sagging bulky heart. We have LV enlargement, volume displacement, and there is encroachment in the left of heart space. So there is RV alive, L, sorry, LV alive. Okay, then we start increase vascularity, LV enlargement, convex MPA. Are they related to MPA and central vessels? So that is ventricular septal 
Okay, so PDA. Okay, so now the shunt is at the level of the blood vessels. Okay, so more blood going into the pulmonary artery, so you would expect this to be large. Increase vascularity, more blood going into the left side, but this time the aorta is included, so this will be enlarged as well. So we have increased vascularity, enlarged NA and LB, and enlarged MPA and central vessels, and an enlarged aortic arch. Okay, so the enlarged aortic arch will distinguish it from BSD because both will have left-sided problems. Okay, so you have, oh, in this case, uh, you might say that this is already diminished, no? Because actually there is no reversal of shock here. There is actual light attention. Okay, so anyway, let's just go to the left ventricle. We have a dilated MPA and central vessels and a dilated aorta. So this patient has PDA with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Okay, so here um, you can see increased vascularity and the enlargement. The convex MPA and a dilated aorta. So this is consistent with pattern ductus arteriosus. Now let's move on to cyanotic congenital heart diseases with increased vascularity. Okay, so these are transposition of great vessels, persistent troncus arteriosus, and PAPDR. Okay, so in transposition of great vessels, you can see now that there is switching of the great vessels. So instead of the RV draining into the pulmonary artery, it will now go to the aorta. And the LB will now go to the pulmonary arteries. Okay, so if without shunt, there will just be two separate circulations that is not compatible with life. Okay, so we would expect to see on X-ray increased vascularity. Pulmonary edema is common. There is enlargement of the heart and it has a typical appearance. We call this the egg on the side, apple on the stem or apple on the screen. So how, how does this happen? No? So normally, we have the RV, which is an inferior chamber, and the left ventricle to store leaf. Okay, so the aorta in the pulmonary arteries will have a slightly side-by-side -side, um, orientation. In TGA, there will be a anteroposterior orientation. So this will appear narrow. So this will give the appearance of the stem or the string. Okay, so you have here an oval shaped part with a narrow vascular pedicle. Okay, so egg shaped part. This is the typical appearance of PGA. So you have increased vascularity, an enlarged part with a oval configuration or egg on the side appearance and a narrow vascular pedicle. Okay, so this one is a, a much nicer image, okay, so you can see increased vascularity and an oval shaped part and narrow vascular pedicle. In persistent truncus arteriosus, you see a common trunk. Okay, so both PA and aorta rises from this common trunk, which will receive blood both from RV and LV. So our expected findings are increased vascularity, the heart is significantly enlarged, and no chamber predominates. Overall configuration is oval. Okay, so we have a concave MPES, exactly type 1. 
and right sided one pouch is 33 to 35 percent. We have a diameter assembly and one pouch. So in type one persistent trunkers, the FPA arises from a near normal allocation. That is why you will still see a convex or a prominent MPA. Okay, so you have an increased vascularity, uh, an enlarged heart, and a convex MPA. So when we see this image, this is not pathognomonic of thrombus. So you can see this also in other conditions like in BOR, BFPS, or in ASB. Okay, so or other shunt anomalies. Okay, so that is why it is important that we have a good clinical impression. Okay, you should know whether the patient is cyanotic or non cyanotic. Okay, so we have increased vascularity okay, and we have a prominent focus and pulmonary artery is convex. So again, this is not of the this type In type 2, we have um, the pulmonary arteries arising posteriorly or in type 2 on the sides. So this is a typical appearance. Okay? So this is more typical. So you have a increased vascularity and in large part, a convex MPA. Okay, so this would um, all are all indicate a focus type two MPA. And if you see a right-sided aortic arch in the presence of hypervascularity, that will be an added um, bonus in your diagnosis. So it will make it easier for you to diagnose this as focus arteriosus. Okay, so you have increased vascularity and a large heart to contain MPA and a right side of the other punch. In PAPDR, okay, so instead of the pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium, they drain into a common vein or a confluence of vessels that will drain back into the right atrium and into the right uh, side. Okay, so you would expect the right side to be prominent or enlarged. Okay, so more blood will go into the circulation and only in the right side. Okay, so hypervascular uh, and enlarged heart with RAMRB prominence and an enlarged systemic vein draining into the right side. Okay, so we have the uh, different types of KPDR. This is type 1 or supracardia, meaning the draining vein is above the heart. Okay, so in type 1, you have the common vessel, the veins draining into a common vessel, which drains in, into the vertical vein, into the dominant vein, and the SBC. And in type 2, 1B, um, there is a confluence of vessels uh, which drains into the left phenomenal vein and into the SBC. Okay, so in type 1, this is the one that gives the snowman appearance. Okay, so you have here a, a chest image with increased vascularity and a large heart. And you see a double density in the supracardiac shadow or above the cardiac shadow. Okay, so this will be the anomalous vessel. Okay, so here's a nice angiographic uh, image for correlation. You can see the um, the draining vein which drains into the, this is a vertical vein draining into the anomaly and into the SBC. Okay, so this is the typical snowman appearance in type 1 KPR. Type 2 KPR or intracardia. Okay, so we have a 
pulmonary, the pulmonary veins draining into either the coronary sinus or directly into the RA. Okay, so you would expect RA and RV enlargement. Okay, so you have an increased vascularity and a right sinus dominance. Okay, so in this case, um, it would be hard for us to say outright that this is type 2 KTBR. So the most that we can do is just give differentials. In type 3, the anomalous vessel is in the cardiac So you can see the pulmonary veins draining into a higher pressure uh, circuit here. Into the below the diaphragm. And because of this, there will be an obstructive effect. So there will be um, more prominent or more often is the pulmonary edema. Okay, so you may have a normal size heart with a prominent heart and less often RV. Okay, so you see uh, cases like this in type 3, you just see uh, pulmonary edema. Okay, so of course we need a good clinical picture correlation. Okay, so it will be hard for us to say outright that this is taking our type 3 unless we have a good um, clinical guide um, correlation. Let's go to congenital heart diseases with decreased vascularity. Okay, so we have tetralogy of the low, pneumonic stenosis, and abstain pneumonia. Okay, so in PAF, okay, so we have here um, the basic uh, pathology is the uh, stenotic valve, pneumonic valve. Okay, so because of this, there will be diminished blood flow, so it will be it will result in a hypervascular lung. Okay, so and because of that, there will be an increase in pressure in the right ventricle, resulting in RV enlargement or RV hypertrophy. Okay, so you, the pulmonary artery will be concave or small, and there will be no prominence of the aorta. Okay, because it will be receiving blood from the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And there will be a VSD. Okay, so right-sided aortic arch is seen in 20 to 25% of cases. Okay, so this is very typical. We have diminished vascularity. Okay, so we have a small right ascending and then very spring appearance. And then we have the RV hypertrophy, the rounding in equipment of the apex. Okay, we have a concave MPA and a right sided aorta. This one, another image of PA. Okay, you can see the rounding of the cardiac apex, concave MPA, and the right sided aorta. Okay, so we don't always see the right side of the aorta, remember, only in 20 to 25 percent. So again, that will be a bonus. If you see a congenital heart with diminished vascularity with right side of the aorta, then most likely it is PLD. Pulmonic stenosis. Okay, so we have more mark to diminish pulmonary blood flow. Okay, so the heart is uh, normal in size, or there may be RV enlargement or prominence. Okay, so you would expect to see this. So instead of having a concave MPA, it will be convex. Okay, so imagine the pneumonic valve is here, and in the RV, a jet proportion of blood forcing its way to a synoptic area, and it will hit the wall of the MPA, which will then result so that is the post hemotic dilatation. Okay, another example. So overall, you see diminished vascularity, diminished, and then you have RV, RV, MA, dilated or a convex MPA. 
In Epstein Simonoli, there is now a utilization of the right wing of the okay, So now there is a displacement of the tricuspid vein into the right wing of the So because the RV is small, the vessels are going into the pulmonary artery, so it should be diminished. So this one, Epstein's, has a typical appearance. So we have the box, the square shaped part. Okay, so here. So why does this happen? So this one is due to the RA enlargement. Okay, so this uh, angular portion here is actually the vestigial artery. So by rotation, this becomes the uh, um, right at uh, the receiver RV. So that is why you end up having a square or box shape part. Okay, so look at the vascularity, it is diminished in hypovascular. Okay, so the aorta is small. Okay, another example, you have a large part, squarish in appearance. Diminished vascularity. Okay, so this is the distance anomaly. Okay, so now let's move on to acquired heart diseases. So just to review, we already mentioned this earlier. Pulmonary venous hypertension. Okay, so normally there is prominence of the lower lobe vessels. Okay, so when there is a progression. Uh, in venous hypertension, there will be equalization or separation, meaning the vessels up and below will be equal in caliber. This will indicate venous hypertension. And then, there will be appearance of curly lines, meaning there is now superject blood or fluid into the interstitial. Okay, so this will indicate interstitial edema. And then finally, the appearance of patchy confluent infiltrates will indicate alveolar edema. So this is the progression. Okay, so in grade 1, or in when there is mean LA or pulmonary venous pressure greater than 10, we initially see an equalization of the upper and lower leg vessels. So there is vascular distribution. So normally, again, we, uh, we should expect more blood here. So when the caliber of the vessels will equal that of the lower lung vessels, then we can say there is equalization. And subsequently, the vessels up here will be larger, so there will now be centralization or upward distribution of pulmonary blood flow. So when we see that, we say that there is already venous hypertension. So in grade 2 or interstitial edema, as seen in mean area or pulmonary venous pressure greater than 20 millimeters, there is now prominence of the interstitial marking. So we can see this reticular or linear densities. Okay. So these are what we call the curly lines. So, curly A lines are horizontal, ah, diagonal, and they are seen emanating from the higher zone, higher area. Curly B and C lines are seen in the bases, more in the bases. So, B are short transverse lines that are seen most often near in the area of the positive angle, and C are actually um, hardly appreciated because they don't really look like lines. They look like cobwebs. So they are actually the B line seen in past. So they look uh, like a mesh of a reticular network. Okay, so when we see these lines, then we can see that there is already interesting for the okay, So this one, a nicer image of uh, curly B lines. LA pressure more than 25 millimeters in the pen, 30 millimeters in um, mercury in tonic. Okay, so we can see confluent assigned shadows. Okay, so now let's go to valvular heart diseases. 
Uh, we will just discuss this, uh, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, AS, AR, and tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, so in MS, uh, okay, so here, we can see the mitral valve here. So it should normally close, no? So in uh, mitral stenosis, there will be a synodic valve. Okay, so instead of... Um, Ejecting blood into the left ventricle, there will now be a uh, damming of blood in the LA. So, there will be an increased pressure in this area in the LA, which will then backflow into the pulmonary circulation, which will give the findings of uh, venous hypertension and congestion, which will then also backflow into the right ventricle. So, we would expect that LA, the left, left atrium, and the left and the right ventricle to be dominant. Okay, so our x ray findings are there will be, so let's follow again our step of vascularity first, uh, heart size and configuration of the cases, okay? So, here we see the equalization or separation of pulmonary blood flow. Okay, so you can see equal caliber vessels up and below. Okay, so in MS, we may have a normal to slightly large heart. So because of the increased pressure, we have the hypertrophy type. So the heart may not be that large. Okay, so we would expect the LA enlargement. So again, what are signs of LA enlargement? We have the double density the LA appendage bulge in here and the widening of the angle. Okay, so and RB as well. Okay. And also the prominent pain can be pain. So uh, we, after describing all this, uh, our diagnosis, uh, we sign this out as cardiovascular findings suggestive of mitral valve pathology with pulmonary arterial based on the related MPA venous hypertension. So pulmonary arterial venous hypertension. Okay, so in MR, okay, so now we have a fraction uh, mitral valve. Okay, so you can see the blood from LA really going into the LB. So blood going in and out of the LA and LB. So you would expect the yeah, LA and LB to be dilated or enlarged. Okay, so there will be an increase in volume. So volume overload. So you have the dilatation type of cardiomegaly. So there will be now backdown of blood into the circulation. So we have signs of venous hypertension, which may even go into the right ventricle. So what do we expect to see? On X-ray, we have um, signs of venous hypertension, either equalization or centralization. And then we have an enlarged heart. Here you can see very well the left atrial double density and the uh, upliftment and widening of the angle and then the area of average. Okay. And you can see a larger heart. Okay, so there, there is actually um, dipping or downward displacement, but it's really hard to say that there is no RV enlargement in this case. Uh, we can better demonstrate that in a supplemental lateral view. Okay, so notice that in MS and MR, uh, that in MR, the heart tends to be larger. Okay, so because you have volume overload, so dilatation time. Whereas in MS, it is um, pressure overload, so high entropy type, and the heart may be near normal or slightly enlarged. Okay, so again, you can see here LA enlargement, and then LB as well as LB. Okay, so here, as I said earlier, you can see the difference. We have a slightly, uh, this is actually still a normal size heart. But this one very large heart. Both have LA enlargement. This one. So this one, we, we can even label this as um, giant LA because you can actually see the LA 
extending beyond the confines of the RA. Okay. okay, now let's go to AS, aortic stenosis. So now we have the area of the aortic valve that is um, that is stenotic. Okay, so you have here now an increase in pressure in the LV. So we have now the LV hypertrophy type. Okay, so imagine this uh, blood trying to force itself way out or through this area, uh, this aortic area. So it will just push and push. It will increase in velocity and push against the wall of the ascending segment. Okay, so on X-ray, what do you expect to see? We have concentric LV hypertrophy. Okay, so the heart is not that large. You see in LV hypertrophy, it's rounding. So you might think that it's similar to RV hypertrophy where there's rounding. But you have to look at the overall picture now. So in RV hypertrophy, you would expect to see some uh, lung findings of either diminished or increased vascularity. Okay? In this case, uh, there's none of that. Okay? And now the aorta will be enlarged, but only the assembly portion. Okay? So you have a slightly enlarged part with LV hypertrophy and a prominent ascending aorta. So when you see this in a young individual like a 17 year old patient male with uh, this kind of things, then this is really suggestive of um, AS. Okay, so since it is farther from the pulmonary circulation, there may or may not be pulmonary venous hypertension, unlike pain like a guy um, pathologies. Okay, so you may also see or not see a tire situation in the area of the aortic valve. Okay, so again, a normal size heart or slightly prominent, a heavy hypertrophy with a prominent ascending segment. So this is highly suggestive of AS. Okay, so in AI or AR, aortic perturbation, you can see now the aortic valve with this fraction. So now there will be a free um, inflow and outflow of blood to the LV and the aorta. So you would expect more blood volume here on the left side. So larger heart. Okay, but this time, the entire force of the aorta will be prominent or dilated. Okay, so we have a larger size heart. And you can see the downward displacement, the saggy or beauty appearance, and the enlargement of the entire force of the aorta. Okay, so again, since it is farther from the circulation, there, from the pulmonary circulation, there may or may not be pulmonary venous hypertension. Okay, so the entire course will be dilated. So again, to differentiate AS and AR, in AS it is um, pressure overloads in hypertrophy type, the heart is uh, near normal or slightly enlarged, whereas in the AR it is volume, so dilatation, so the heart is larger. Okay, so another example, we have an LB and a prominent aorta. Okay, so lastly of the valves, vagular uh, pathologies, we have TR. So we usually see this in um, those with severe um, MS. So there will be back down in the blood in the RV into the right atrium. So, all the findings of plus are in the motion. So, uh, when you see this, I will just say um, mitral valve and inconical um, tricuspid valve pathology. Okay. Okay.
So here you can see a very um, donated right page from this one. Okay, so that's it. Um, that was my last slide. And um, thank you very much for your attention.